I was in war zones in and out for 24 years. So I'm a very direct person with the thought that if I hold back from you or I don't share information with you, that could get you killed. Got my pilot's license in the late 90s and starting in, I guess it was 2004, started building a World War I fighter aircraft called a Fokker triplane. It had three wings, very distinctive. You know, I built my macho fighter plane that looks really cool. And then I thought, well, now I'm going to build the little whimsical airplane that looks like it came out of a Disney cartoon. And it was on my second flight that I lost my engine. Because the shape of the fuselage, the body of the aircraft, was kind of like a boat at the front. I thought, well, I can't make it back to my airstrip, you know, my dead engine. So I'll aim for this small lake at the nearby Boy Scout camp. What happened was I almost succeeded. I overshot the bank of the lake and I crashed into all these trees at 70 miles an hour in the equivalent of a soapbox derby car with a big motorcycle engine and spinning propeller right in front of my face. I don't know how I did eat it. Ruptured both my lungs, broke all my ribs. My right leg had multiple fractures. My chin was all torn up and I uh, had a hole in my lower back from the battery breaking loose and hitting me again about 70 miles an hour. Lucky for me, there was, even though the Boy Scout camp was closed at that time of year, being October, uh, there was uh, one guy fishing there. And what made it lucky for me was not only was he there, but he was a retired police officer. You can imagine if somebody watched a plane crash and then saw somebody like I described I was in that crash, you can imagine a lot of people would just freak out. Yeah. Being a retired police officer, he'd probably seen trauma in car accidents or in abuse. I mean, he, you know, he, he was used to shifting gears into that mindset and he luckily had his phone on him that day, his cell phone. Normally he left it in his truck because he likes his peace and quiet, but he did have it on him. So he was able to call 911. And Life Star sent a helicopter in to pull me out. And then they flew me up to Hartford, Connecticut, to the trauma center there. My near-death experience is pretty different than a lot of people's. Many death experiences are stories of where, one way or another, People arrive at the door of death, whether it's an accident, whether it's a disease, whether it's, you know, they fell down the stairs or, or just it just spontaneously happened. But a lot of times, you know, talk about going through a tunnel, seeing dead loved ones, seeing angelic or beautiful beings, getting a life review. Maybe they then get a big message or make a big choice and then they come back. For me, no tunnel, no dead loved ones, no life review. It was like I teleported and boom, I'm somewhere else immediately. And I was up on a terrace of a tall building in a ruined landscape. Imagine the biggest city you've ever seen. Imagine it a thousand years after a nuclear blast or the meteor strike or something like that. I mean, absolute ruins. And so as I'm looking out across this, these deep, dark clouds are above me, like the mother of all storms is getting ready to break loose. I mean, it's, it's scary. Just looking at these clouds is, could be frightening. I wasn't frightened, but I'm saying it could be. All of a sudden, I felt this wave of nausea go through my stomach. And I thought, I don't think I can stand this. And I said this out loud. And when I did, I heard the sound off to my left. And I look along the terrace and parked a little distance away, not too far, was a large, like, egg-shaped sculpture. I would say it was like four or five stories high. And because it was made out of lattice work, I could see through it. So like it was made out of these bands, right? And as I could see through it, I could see into it, and I saw these little movements. So I thought, well, what's this all about? It's the only interesting thing going on, right? Because the whole city's dead. So I walked over there and I looked through the lattice work, and there were these particular kind of gears called sector gears. When you think of a gear, you think of a circle with all these little teeth. The sector gear is a partial, it's a section of the gears. And it's usually meant to move back and forth. You might see this in like a motorcycle transmission. You will definitely see them in clock-like mechanisms or in clocks. As I looked at them, some were very clear and definite. Some were very like ghost-like, but they would just pass through each other. And they were kind of freely suspended in the air. I was very confused about what it was. So I reached through to see if I could touch one. And when I did, one brushed by my hand and I got another wave of nausea. And when that happened, I instinctively grabbed it, pulled it through the lattice and threw it away. Don't know how I knew I could do that or why I would do that, but I did it. And when I did that, all the gear started madly spinning around like they were recalibrating for the loss of one. And at that point, I said, what is this thing? And then this voice came that stayed with me through the entire experience. And it said, 
this is the process of becoming. This is the future birthing into the now. And I said, you know, I really don't understand. You know, like, where am I? And I said, you're in the in-between. And I said, in between what? It said everything. It said, you're standing inside the eternity of a single moment. And I said, that makes no sense whatsoever. And I said, well, do you remember the body to which your spirit belongs? And I really remember thinking, and I, I have no clue. I have no clue. I am just here. I am present. And, and, and it said, then you see the truth and how the past is dust. Someone had come up to me and said, if you stay here longer, you can't go back. I literally would have said, go back where? To your family, to earth, to your life. I would have been what family, what earth, what life? I'm just going to say it. I was that depersonalized and disassociated. I wouldn't have known my name. As I looked at the gears, I could actually see a video feed playing in my head of what each one represented. And I realized, oh, these are events in my future. And the reason I knew it was my future is because in a couple of the gears, I might see my children grown up with their own children and myself as older. So, okay, so this is in my future. So I said, you know, what happened when I touched that one gear and I and it felt bad? And it said, all choices have unintended consequences. Some good, some not good. By reaching through and touching the different possible futures, these are possible outcomes. The ones that were definite are more likely. The ones that were ghost-like were less likely or further out in time. Basically said, how did I know I could remove that bad future, the one that would make me feel bad in the future? And they said, why else are you here? I said, I have no clue. And they said, well, this is why you're here. You've been given a chance essentially to stack the deck for your future. We can't say wrong decisions because you can make a wrong decision and there's no sin. You know, I mean, you could just say, I thought I was going to turn right and I turned left and I had a car accident. Well, it wasn't your fault, so there's no sin. But a bad decision is. That's where you might, you know, where in, in a certain degree of ambiguity where there are moral or ethics concern, or maybe there's no ambiguity. You just said, no, I just want to do that thing anyway. I don't care who it hurts. I don't care if it's good or bad. I just want to do it. That's a bad decision. So being human, I mean, we all face those choices. It's no sin to be tempted. It's just, it's just one to say, I'm going to do it. So I was able to use pain as my guide. Didn't have some great moral compass. Didn't have a religious ideologue. Didn't have a mantra. You know, it's pain because that's pretty sure. You don't really argue with pain, right? You could argue otherwise. Like, why does this choice that won me a lottery ticket, why is that making me feel bad? Say, because you're going to become the biggest jerk in the world who's ever lived. Well, you can imagine most of us would say, no, I won't. I promise. Let me have it. But if you feel the outcome of that decision, if you feel the pain that you're going to cause, you're not arguing with anybody. Pretty damn clear. Basically, I just kept reaching through the egg and finding gears that hurt, pulled them out, watched the damn thing just recycle over and over and over and over again, and, and had the ongoing conversation with this voice. At one point, I turned around and I saw this huge growing pile of gears, right? And I said, damn, it looks like if I don't have a bad future, I don't have any future at all. <laughs> yes, I said, am I going to die sooner from doing all this? And it said, your number of breaths are already counted. I will worry about your last one. And then it said, when I said, I don't know when or where these futures occur, and I said, that's not important. It said, but for those who make poor use of their choices, offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. Wow. And so eventually I just got so tired of seeing these gears spin around and around and around again. And basically I was seeing all these futures in my life that could be. That's a lot of information to bring back. And I was even told at one point, knowing what or when, it's not important. Having faith in the grand design is. And so I said, okay. But at some point I said, okay, I think I can live with this now, <laughs> you know, because I think, I think everything looks good. And it gave me a few parting words. One was, all the force of will you'll ever need is found in the art of letting go. Always live life in celebration of the individual spirit. For no one and no thing can stand before the brilliance of a truly naked soul. Pay more attention to your relationships and be gentle with everyone as I am gentle with you. And I said, what's gentle about all this? You know, thinking about the pain. They said, your being here is in response to a prayer you made one day in the midnight of your soul. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. Wow. And it sent me back. 
at one point, the uh, in-between said, you know, the in-between isn't a place you go to or come from. It's a place you are, which is kind of interesting because, I mean, if anybody knows the Bible, Luke 12, 21 says, many are those who will say, here is the kingdom of God or there is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is neither here nor there. It's within you. And because of that, I've started to wonder if the fact that or what looks like a fact that maybe 10 percent of the world has had a near-death experience which is a hell of a lot of people. Yeah. It's like 700 million people. It's made me wonder if that's what the second coming is all about. Would you be no more or less paradigm busting than the first coming? It would just be different. But it would be true to that state that it's within you. And the mm -hmm. lesson there is that if it can be in me, it can be in you. It could be with anybody. And not everybody needs a two by four upside the head with a near death experience to get there. Some people can get through just meditating. You know, some people, because we're inclined to be that way. Did you, did you ever figure out what the prayer was that got you there? It would have probably it could have been just something as simple as being disgusted with the world and saying, give me a sign. Okay. It didn't yeah. have to be anything profound. It just had to be honest, sincere and meaningful. And that it might have been one of those. And that could have been when I was five years old. You know, I don't have any idea right. of when, but okay. it planted a seed. And then one day that seed took fruit. And then do you have any idea why it was post-apocalyptic? Like, do you think it's always like that way? Or was it just like a projection of part of your mind? Or Yeah, I think it was created just for me in that moment. Yeah. And then I think when I was gone, it was gone. It's hard to say why. People have said, well, because... You know, you, you design satellite systems and because you're in IT and because you built airplanes, that's why it had sort of a mechanical, almost like a steampunk <laughs> look to oh, it. You yeah. know, gears and who knows, who cares? You know, that same scene, if you think about it, could have played out as a beautiful garden with weeds and the weeds needed to be pulled because those were the bad, ex bad gears, right? So right. who really cares? Well, the reason I ask what, what you know, why it was post-apocalyptic or different for you because I've just seen a lot of people like in the comments of near death experiences get really hung up on why they're different. And I just mm -hmm. think it's important. Or I think it's interesting. Um, well, someone once said like God will approach you in whatever way he can get through to you. And like, and so God is infinite. Yeah. So the uh, near death experiences are going to be infinite in their scope. So that's a good way that? of putting it. Yeah. I think also in terms of that, um, it's interesting because like you say, when you listen to a lot of near death experiences, they do sound different. You know, um, some may be even hellish by comparison. Mm -hmm. right? But what's really weird is once you've had a near-death experience, it, it's amazing how people who haven't will say they sound different. And people who have had a near-death experience will say, here's how they sound the same. Mm -hmm. our, our milestones in our listening are different. And we know what we're listening for. And... There's a subtle authenticity, too, that you get better at picking up on. And it has a lot to do with what people are focusing on in their stories. But there's also just a vibration there. And I, I've marveled at how stories can, on the outside, sound different. But I'm hearing that it's the same experience. It's just, you know, individually described this way. Yeah. But uh, if you ever were to go to an International Association of Near-Death Studies National Conference, it's amazing how when people come out of a conference room and they look at you, there's almost a hint of recognition in their eyes. And how many, I'd say every spare two seats or three seats or a sofa in the lobby of this convention center were taken up by people sitting there sharing with strangers intimate details of their lives because they had this connection. Each able to finish each other's sentences. It's, I've never experienced anything like that. I'm not airy fairy. Like I said, I was in wars for 24 years. I was a war correspondent for NBC News. I, I really tell it like it is. So that's how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. I, I appreciate that. And then, so what's the best way for people to contact you? Or do you want people to contact you? I know you have a website, you have a YouTube channel, sure. you have all kinds of things. So Sure, sure, sure. Well, I am moving to Mexico, but I'm available even down there. You know, we have great cell service and all that. Um my website, again, is inbetweenproductions.com, all one word, inbetweenproductions.com. My narrative is there. A few podcast links are there. Um, and then my contact information is there. So you can reach out to me there. Uh, and then 
you can ping me with an email and I'll I will respond. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to talk, I can usually find time to chat with people. I have two books out. They're on Amazon. One is called The In-Between, Trip of a Lifetime. And the other is The Practice In-Between, The Art of Letting Go. And that one I'm very happy with. It's short. The And I do the audio, I do the audio for both books for, oh, on nice. Audible. The first book, I know, it's like a little over five hours. That second book is a little over um, three hours. It's not very long, but I really like the way it all came together. And I actually don't even remember writing that second book. It's as if it were just, yeah. What, what does a soup know of the spoon it's ladling? Sweet, sour, hot, cold, good, bad, doesn't. It just ladles soup because that's its job. That's sort of how I feel uh, I'm, I'm acting sometimes. Hey, thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to know what video to watch next, I would suggest this one. This seems like a really good video for you to watch right now. Yeah, that seems like a good one. Oh, you could subscribe. You could do that too. Subscribe or watch this video. Up to you. Bye-bye.